before we get into the main brief primer, uh, just a salute and a shout out to uh, JBK Campin. Uh, I see your short brother, that uh, basically the, the short video, uh, lunch with Kenny Veach, your lunch at Kenny, with Kenny Veach at the mine. Nice ride, a nice setup, very nice setup. And, you know, basically salutes to you. So, got your comment and respond to it. Uh, we're mainly lone wolves, but basically uh, kind of caught us at the end of our career. So, we're retiring and uh, you're upcoming. But basically, um, just a quick perspective that, in my opinion, that mine shaft is just the dilapidated, dangerous uh, death trap. The... Uh, there's been a lot of damage to the mine, and the way I see it, so first of all, you had uh, uh, basically uh, Scott Nuttall, SB, other people have uh, thoroughly explored the mine. Uh, there's another group that explored the mine, but basically, uh, and apparently there was some damages to it, but basically, I personally view it as just, uh, I kind of view it as emblematic. This, this mine shaft that stands tall and upright, representing the moral character. The, the upright char moral character and fitness of Kenny Veach, that mine shaft standing tall and upright as an eternal monument, a thousand year monument to the to the man of Kenny Veach. Um, but personally, no, I, I don't I don't think he's any. Uh, basically, he's definitely not down the shaft. And you know, my recommendations for you know people to stay away from from the shaft, basically, you know, um, that that thing is a death trap. So. Uh, there's, you know, there's no one down there. It's just, uh, it's just a hazard accident waiting to happen. But, you know, um, basically, you know, I, I salute you. Uh, stay safe, brother. And, uh, um, yeah, we're just, we're, I'm personally, I'm just mopping up. It's, it's the end of my search career. Yeah, if you can, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek career. You know, basically the end of a career that's not a career. But, you know, uh, but now we're pivoting on to another topic. So we were going to pivot pivot to a more academic uh, perspective. So there's different programs, uh, different, you know, basically there's one year programs in international law. Um, the reason why we don't want to do it is because, first of all, we have no need for it professionally. We don't want, basically, we don't need it for a job. Okay, um, we don't want to basically entrench ourselves into some academic circle and basically. Um, the law is something you can study even on your own, the international law. Okay, so there's a difference between if you want to be an officer of the bar, you have to have certain uh, professional certifications, not just a JD degree. If you have a JD, if you have a, that's just a paper on your wall, unless you're unless you're appointed an officer of the bar, in which you can basically you can theoretically be a criminal defense attorney or a state prosecutor, but you have to be on the bar as a as an officer of the bar. So that's a technicality. So, one aspect, what we want to do is different from the rest of the YouTube world. We want to, we want to basically uh, do it in an academic way, where we, we're going to use the description, this description field as a sort of, uh, basically, an abstract with a formal bibliography with sources cited. So, basically, it's, going, it's a return to the collegiate system, and we're going to, we're going to be doing that through YouTube. And so one, one aspect that we looked at is basically, so consider this aspect of international humanitarian law, which is the law of armed conflict. We read in the news that basically there is a Ukrainian strike upon, uh, that basically Ukrainian military strike that killed a Russian performer. Uh, but so we were looking at basically, is there violations of international humanitarian law that's happening? Is there a violation of Geneva? Is there a violation of the law that's happening? by Russia and Ukraine. So to the best of our knowledge, there are, there are violations happening and most of them are basically being attributed to Russia. So we took a look at this. This is just a salient preview and example. To the best of our knowledge, if the Ukrainian military struck basically a military position and you, you see in that viral um, whatever news report that basically you see the Russian soldiers concentrated in that theater. So if we're saying if and only if that's a military uh, encampment, it would seem that the casualty of one Russian actor, actress, performer, singer, 
would be a form of collateral damage that may or may not be justified under international law. So if you look at military situations, what's an off limits, off limits? Okay, a mosque, a church, a school, a kindergarten. Under international law, there's cultural sites are protected. Hospitals are pr protected under international law. This is why you see certain hospitals in Hawaii painted. Uh, basically, hospitals are marked so you, you can see it from the sky. This off limits. It's a hospital. It's a hospital. Don't attack. Okay. You don't attack civilians. When the Japanese Zeros were passing through, uh, what is it, Kaneohe? You, you, you see that scene where the civilians are waving to the Zero pilot. You don't attack. You don't strafe civilians. Okay. But what happens when a mosque is no longer is converted into an ammunition depot, a weapons cache, where you no longer have worshippers, but primarily militant fighters? Then does the mosque does a normally protected place lose its protected status? If a hospital is converted to an active weapons cache, an active military uh, encampment site, what happens if they become dual use? What if it's 20% hospital and 80% combatant facilities? So the law of armed conflict does apply and do our nuances where a mosque is converted uh, so basically in whole to a weapons cache or basically basically a rallying point for militants. So the fact that the Ukrainian struck and killed a Russian singer um, doesn't necessarily imply, does not necessarily mean that the law of armed conflict was violated. So you have to look at and apply the protocols, the these specific protocols of the of the laws of international humanitarian law in very carefully. And there's Geneva Conventions, there's the protocols. And again, we, we, are, we need to do a refresher on this, but we just want to say that the law is very interesting 